So um, now we're coming um, to our second panel of today. Um, it's about the topic, um, show me the money and the challenges of today's investment world. Um, for, the, for this panel, I'd like to welcome our host, um, Olya Klüppel from ESO Capital. Um, please come to stage, thanks that you're supporting us. Thank you. There are four participants at our panel. I would like to first uh, welcome Tamo Zwinger from Companista. If you could briefly introduce yourself. Um. Oh. The mic's not working, is it working? Yes. Okay. Yeah, hi, um, I'm Tamo Zwing, I'm one of the co-founders of um, Companisto. Companisto is a crowd investing uh, platform, so we're raising um, money for young startup companies from private investors on our website. Um, we're online since um, June 2012. And we raised um, about 1.5 euro, million euro in that time. Previously um, to working at Companisto, I was working at CMS Hasse Ziegler, which is a major international law firm. And I was working in the um, domain of mergers and acquisition, private clients, and corporate law. And previously to that, I founded another startup and um, was managing the startup for four years before I sold my shares. The next panelist is Sean Seaton Rogers, a general partner at Profounders Capital. Please welcome. Mm. Excellent. Great. Uh, thanks. Super excited to be here. Uh, my name is Sean. I am with Profounders Capital, and we are actually a venture capital fund based in London, investing throughout Europe. And I suppose what's unique about ProFounders is that all the money in the fund comes from successful entrepreneurs. So we have this network of 21 different founders who commit both their time and their money to ProFounders Capital. And I'm um, happy to be investors in two Berlin companies. So get your guide and then nine flats as well. Okay. The next on the panel is Stefan Bayer. He's a, found, a founder of Sofa Tutor. SofaTutor is an online education platform. We, um, we produce online education videos. We've covered almost the whole school curriculum of the German-speaking market. So high school students come to SofaTutor and they find over 10,000 learning videos that explain mathematics, English, German. They can do interactive tests. They can chat with real teachers. And um, we're selling uh, subscriptions, monthly subscriptions. We launched in 2009. Um, we're around 80 people full time in the office right now. So we are a mid sized um, Berlin startup. Yeah. Thank you. And the last one, uh, but not least, is Fabian Siegel from Global Founders Capital. Um, so my, yeah, my name is Fabian. Um, I'm a partner in a fund called Global Founders Capital. We are a 150 million euro fund, pretty new fund, around eight weeks. Uh, based out of Berlin with the global investment focus. So we do deals all over the world, but love to do deals in Berlin as well, obviously. Great. And we hope to uh, walk you through the whole life of the uh, startup, uh, from getting angel funding to sort of hopefully having an exit. We talked today about a few exits in Germany. The first uh, question perhaps to our panelists is, uh, as a young startup, do I really want to go to an incubator or do I want to develop my business model a little bit further and go to a, VC, a traditional VC? What do you think? Um, well, I can only talk of experience. Um, Sofa Tutor was an independent um, team, uh, independent startup, still is. Um, it was a pretty naive idea. We started out thinking we could do some crowdsourcing educational product that didn't work in the first place, so we had to pivot a few times. Um, I, th I think it depends on if you already have an idea on what you want to do and how crazy that idea is, or if you just say, OK, maybe you're one of the guys walking around on events like this saying, ah, I'm going to found something sooner or later, and you don't even have an idea yet. So. That would probably be a good uh, thing then to go to an incubator because there's people who have good ideas, people who know the market, who might know that some idea is flying somewhere else already. So you go there, they give you an idea and also quite a lot of uh, knowledge. But if you have an idea already that might even be a little bit more special um, and you already have some experience, then you really have to evaluate, I think, what uh, an incubator can bring to the table. Um, because all that marketing knowledge, finance knowledge, you can find it elsewhere too, also money. So um, I think it really depends on um, where you are at. 
you have an idea, if you don't, if you have a team already, if you don't, if you have experience or not. Maybe Fabian, you are, you've been Fabian, you sit on the other side, what do you think? Well, I've done both. So I have uh, built businesses from scratch without an incubator. I have actually worked with an incubator setup. Um, and I think there is um, uh, uh, a lot of support you get in incubators. So it feels like you build your business and you have like the wind blowing in your back. You know, so mm -hmm. it, everything goes faster and easier and you get support. Um, so I feel like if it's your first company, uh, you can learn a lot in an incubator setup. Um, but uh, you, there is, there is uh, another side to that, is that it's not your own company from, that you build from scratch. Now you, you have other people that influence the company as well. It's obvious when you have co-founders. So I think both um, is a, a different model and both works well. Uh, it really depends on um, uh, how much support you want for your, for your idea. I think there's one more. Maybe I can add a little personal detail. Um, maybe it's an ego thing. Uh, what I observe is there's some incubators who really let the founders be the founders. So they appear in public. They're the founders from day one till um, the end, um, till the startup is sold or whatever happens to the startup. And then there's incubators where you don't even really know who was the founder and who then became CEO and COO and positions switch so often. So that's for me personally, that would also be something uh, to look at. Rather, the incubator kind of gives you the space to be the founder in public, or if it's just a, a project from some incubator and you are just an employee. Yeah, and I, I think one has to say too that um, if, if even if you're going to an incubator as a startup, um, that still means that eventually you probably have to get VC funding though. So it's not either or. I would say, so even if you go to an incubator, you will still need VC money. It's more in the beginning. Do you have, like you were saying, do you have all the skills in your team and your startup, the experiences and maybe the resources to build up the company by yourself? If you don't, then an incubator would be a great idea. Otherwise, you might want to save your shares. Yeah. And, and, and on top of that, I remember, as, as a founder, your most important thing that you own, actually, is that equity. And so it's a trade-off that you have to make and think through what are the benefits, because you're giving up equity for it, right? That's what you're getting. Now you're getting help, and you have to make that trade-off. Um, there are some times, though, with incubator models, and, and different incubators work in different ways, and they call them accelerators now anyway, I think, because incubators got a bad, you know, bad, uh, bad reputation. But the accelerator programs, um, you have to really start thinking through at the later rounds, what is the founder going to have left? So after you've been through an incubator and then a first round and a second round, the investor starts to really worry that the founder doesn't actually own enough of the business to really continue to put in the 23 hours a day of work. Mm -hmm. I guess the next stage is um, when you're approaching whatever source of capital you decided to approach, um, how honest do you want to be about your business plan? Some VCs want to help want to hear about billion dollar companies, others might not, or others might want to hear about the largest market possible. Would you like to take that as a capital provider? Yeah, sure. So we, yeah, we receive tens of business plans per day. Um, and we have, we have a joke statement, which is that all entrepreneurs lie all the time um, <laughs> on business plans. Because the fact is, you have to lie. Because you're basically trying to forecast five, six years what it's going to look like. And the reality is, no one can forecast what the business is going to look like in five or six years. And so uh, it, it was a complete joke that entrepreneurs lie, just to so say everyone knows. Uh, but because uh, VCs lie all the time as well. So, um, so it works out well. But the, the fact is, the only reason an investor actually wants to see the business plan going forward is because they want to see how an entrepreneur thinks about the company and what the business and how, what they think the major challenges are going to be. Um, and so with respect to, you know, entrepreneurs are smart people, VCs are smart people, you have to have open conversations about what the issues and concerns and risks are going to be. If an entrepreneur comes to me and says, uh, it's going to be super easy, there's not going to be any problems along the way, that'll actually make me very worried because there should be some major concerns that the founder has about how the business is going to grow. And you want to have a real discussion about that. Yeah. And Perhaps I, you can add from your experience as an yeah, entrepreneur, just how did from, you approach that? From personal experience, what I really like about my investors is that I always can uh, go there and uh, talk about corridors, like best case scenarios, worst case scenarios. So it's always a corridor we are talking about. Um, and I like that much more than investors uh, who sit at the table and say, we want to see this being a billion dollar company, which kind of like makes the, the lying thing. Uh, you, 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 say, you say, okay, okay, you really want to hear that this is going to be a billion dollar company? Okay, so I'm going to write the business plan for a billion dollar company. Why, in fact, it's much more honest and much more fun to talk in corridors, I think. Yeah. I, th I think that's a good way to go to because um, often it's not about lying or not saying the truth. It's, it's also about uh, lack of experience that um, founders simply d don't know that this is unrealistic, what they're saying. That they might truly believe that this is really how it's going to happen. 
you know, that th these numbers are valid, that it's going to be like this. But in many cases, it's, it's simply not l as easy as this, and numbers are not um, reached. Yeah, I always say when somebody comes is that they have the opportunity to set the right expectations. No? Success equals efforts divided by expectations. So you set the wrong expectations that you can't miss, uh, that you have to miss, then you miss them and people will think you're a failure, even you might have been very successful. So the one hand side, you have to be realistic and you have to make sure you believe you can achieve it. And you have to be realistic whether it's a big business at the end, because maybe it's not a big business, and then it's not a big business. And then maybe you need a different kind of investor or no investor, you should maybe slowly grow the business. So I am a big fan of saying, be very truthful to yourself, set the right expectations, and people think you are successful because you hit what you told people you will achieve. And if the reality is that it's not a big business, then that's okay. It's just a different way for you to move forward, and you don't want to waste 10 million euros, 100 million euros, and then people will believe you, and then they'll wake up, and you'll wake up, and then you're in a bad position. So I think always be very, very honest and realistic about what you can achieve, um, and lying doesn't pay off in the end, no? I mean, obviously. Although that brings uh, to the point of uh, raising capital in Europe versus raising capital in the US. We've heard earlier today that uh, the mentality is a little bit different in the US. The availability of capital is... Uh, obviously different from the amount of money. Uh, should entrepreneurs who are in Germany want to stay in Germany or whatever in Europe raise money in the US? And if so, when? Would you like to take that, Sean? Yeah, sure. So, um, so actually, both of our, our Berlin-based companies, Nine Flats and Get Your Guide, have raised uh, next rounds of capital, Redpoint um, with Nine Flats and uh, Spark Capital with Get Your Guide out of the US. So there's definitely a time and a place for bringing on um, kind of US investors. I personally believe at the early stages of a company's life cycle, it's, it's a local game. Um, and so that's local assistance. So whether it's local angels, local VCs, because there's a lot that, that can go wrong and there's a lot of kind of sharing of thoughts and advice, et cetera. When you get to a different stage of a company's development, it's different kinds of issues that you face. You know, you've proven product market, now it's about how you scale a company, how you hire, that sort of stuff. Um, and at that point, you can then raise the big international round of capital. Um, and, and I think the benefits of the US investors, because people say, oh, should we raise from the big European investors or the big US investors? And the fact is, you want to raise money, good, good money, you know, money is the most important thing, so wherever it comes from is completely fine. On top of that, you can then think about the different um, kind of benefits or concerns that come from that money. I, I will say, I think the US investors definitely are kind of very aggressive and really go for it. So if they, they, they've got a lot of money to deploy, if they like a business, if you've proven that you've got product market fit, if you've proven that you can scale marketing in a certain area, they will really, for companies that are like that at that stage, give them a lot of money to really be aggressive and grow throughout the world. Um, and so I really like that, that kind of mentality. Uh, and then on top of that, you know, if you are able to, if you do raise money from a big U.S. investor, it kind of alerts some of the potential buyers as well. It, you know, the, the big acquirers generally in the U.S. and they go, oh, so and so invest in that company. Uh, are you as someone from the U.S. invest in that company, there must be something there. What's going on? And they start looking at it. So I think there's a lot of, a lot of benefits that come from it. But if you look at the overall numbers, there's very few deals still being done by U.S. investors in Europe. So given that of the tons of startups there are, there's maybe five or ten deals a year. So therefore, if you're a startup and you have very little time, and time is the most uh, important resource, um, most likely you, a U.S. investor will not be the right investor for you. It's just unlikely, unless you are at a stage where the people come knocking your door. And I think most of the U.S. deals we saw in Europe, the U.S. guys actually approached the targets here, not the other way around. So I think the U.S. guys will knock on your door when you're ready. Uh, don't waste your time in Sand Hill Road. Uh... As an entrepreneur, have you thought about raising money in the US? Yeah, but we are such a German-focused uh, product, it's German language. Um, I didn't spend so much energy on finding US investors yet now. I guess uh, the next round, we've uh, talked about some of the traditional f uh, sources of funding. Uh, there is a new source now, uh, crowdsourcing. Can you add us? a little bit uh, what you think about it, what are the advantages, disadvantages, and... Uh... Yeah, well, um, what we do at Competis at least is crowd investing, so that means that it's equity-based crowdfunding. People can come on our website and then um, see, ha have a range of, of startups there and then can decide to invest in them and then get shares uh, in return. And I think it, it is um, definitely a new um, source of money, but um, I wouldn't call it um, really a competition for um, VC funding in a later stage because it's very early stage money that you're getting. It's, it's an addition to, to, to the traditional financing sources. Um, 
the startups that get funded on uh, crowd investing websites um, can be a VC startups or, or VC cases in a later stage, but they're uh, most likely in a stage where VC um, would simply say, okay, uh, sounds interesting, the idea, but the startup doesn't have enough traction yet and um, is not far enough in its stage, so I will not invest right now. But um, crowd investing um, exactly kicks in in this um, spot. So after the startup um, spent uh, the initial amount of funding that they got from friends, family, and fools, and um, then um, are running out of money, that, that's a very good time for, for um, uh, crowd investing because also crowd investing gives you, um, of course, marketing. If you do crowd investing, you're exposed to a very big public. Um, you might get first customers straight away, um, although you, you're just uh, brand new on the market. And that's, of course, a very interesting um, thing. But uh, in general, it's, it's, um, it's an addition to the traditional sources. And also our deal flow that we're having at Companisto mainly comes from recommendations from um, either VCs or business angels who might have invested earlier already in the companies or incubators, accelerators, or corporate finance companies. Can, can, can I be controversial? Not, go ahead. I was going to ask. You know, I always, we spoke earlier, and I, I usually hate boring panels, so we try to be controversial and have some fun with this. So it's great. So Tom was trying to put us out of business um, as VCs, right? Just kidding. Um, but he wants to help companies raise money. So the question that I've always got about the crowdfunding platforms, and it's about Kickstarter as well, so everyone hears about Kickstarter all the time. And, and how do you guys deal with it when, uh, you know, if I was an unethical person, which I'm not, um, yeah. I would create a fake company, go up there, talk about how great it is, raise one million euros, and then disappear to the Caribbean islands. Um, how, do you, how do you deal with that? Because I know when we invest, there's, there's a, you know, we spend a fortune on legal fees and research and, and putting in the right contracts to prevent that from happening. How do you deal with that kind of legal thorny issue? And yeah. to add to that question, how do you prevent that it, the deals that are being thrown to you by VCs or by angel investors are simply not the deals that they don't want to do? Sure. Yeah, sure. Two uh, valid questions, yeah, <laughs> not the first time that I heard them. <laughs> so I haven't asked one so far. First thing is, um, well, different to um, Kickstarter, we're making a pre-selection, of course. There's um, really only a few startups out of uh, 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 really uh, a few hundreds that get on the page. So it's in a very um, low percentage, maybe two, three percentage of the startups that contact us, or even less, get on the page. So there's a very few startups. We, we financed 13 startups so far. In the last 10 months, we, we just got online um, 10 months ago, and we're very closely looking at them, of course. We're meeting the founders, we're making the due diligence. As I said, I've been working at CMS such as Eagle, which is a major international law firm in mergers and acquisitions and specialized on doing due diligences. So yeah. we're doing the due diligence, we're investigating the business models. We have, of course, staff also in our team who looks on a startup as incubators or VCs or business angels do too. So um, we're making very sure that this startup has potential. I mean, uh, I'm not a prophet. In the end, we don't know. The investor who's going to invest on a website will decide, is this something that convinces me or not? But we can, of course, make a very good um, pre-selection. And um, your question was? Uh, My question was similar in the sense that when the deals are referred to you, how do you make sure that the deals yeah. are referred to you are not yeah. the bad deals? I mean, the deals that the angel investor does not want to do. I mean, um, in the end, especially in Germany, the um, venture capital scene is pretty, well, it's not that big, yeah, let's say it that way. Uh, people know each other, and if you meet people all the time, you will not recommend me a bullshit deal for the third time, fifth, fifth time, and you see me all the time on events. And it doesn't make sense also from a VC perspective to just recommend me a bad deal because you wouldn't have anything out of it. It doesn't make sense to him. You wouldn't makes no sense, but if he recommends me a deal that is interesting for him in the longer run, but now at this moment he simply cannot invest because it's too early stage, and then we invest 250K maybe, or 500K or whatever, that money that startup needs to, uh, to get it to a stage where it's interesting for, um, to, um, for a VC, then he also gains something out of it. So it's personal relationship, of course, and also uh, simply business thinking that prevents this. I think until now we've focused sort of on very early stage investing. We talked and we uh, heard a lot today that uh, late stage investment is a little bit difficult in Germany. There's little capital, in particular equity capital. Uh, one solution that we see is what our firm provides, uh, which is venture debt. Uh, but what are other options to entrepreneurs who now uh, grew their company to a certain level, still need capital, do not see, are not yet ready for an exit? What do you do? 
I think there is, um, um, there's a lot of access to later stage capital um, once the business is ready and you have the data to show. So I always feel like um, when you have the right data that proves your unit economics, that's a profitable business, that you might not be profitable as a company, but for every customer you buy, you get a certain return. Uh, if you can show these metrics, understand these metrics, there is a lot, a lot of capital out there and there is venture debt out there, which I think is very interesting because there's more and more companies that I see that have access to venture debt facilities, which five years ago in Europe was very unheard of. Uh, and I think that's a great addition to bridge a company that's close to profitability, people have diluted already a lot, but they don't want to dilute much more, uh, but there's very clear cash flows coming in. Uh, so I think it's very exciting that there's more and more venture, venture debt deals happening in, in Europe. And, and I think given that we are in a low yield environment, uh, capital looking for yield, I think there'll be more and more venture debt coming, hopefully. I think it will be good for all ventures here that, that we have in the room. How do you deal with, some, you invested perhaps with some of the funds that per perhaps today do not have any more money, but the companies are viable. How do you deal with the, uh, as a VC, with the issue of lack of capital in Europe? Sorry, so, so the question is... How do you deal with, with the issue, as a VC, that some of your partners with whom you invested yeah, might not sorry. have enough co capital to support the companies going forward? Yeah, no, it's, uh, that's, that's always an issue. Um, I think the good news is it's, it's pretty easy to figure out kind of who those people are. You can look to see whether they've made investments recently or not. They call them kind of ghost funds that are out there. But I think our approach, the way we deal with it, is every time we go into an investment, for every euro we invest, we set aside another euro for follow-on investment. So we make sure that we have the capital to support the company through some tough times. But then we make, this, we make sure that our partners in the investment do the exact same thing. So we're incredibly, we're not choosy, sorry. We, we, we first want to make an investment. We like a company. We then have to convince the company about why they should take our money. Um, we have to sell our network and the value that we can provide because you can't ever assume that someone will take your money just because you want to give it to them. But then we work together with the company and the other investors to figure out the right syndicate and the right structure to put it together. And I think, uh, unlike some other venture funds, we actually, we don't necessarily care about ownership stake and that kind of stuff. We just want to work with good entrepreneurs and then figure out the best financing structure. And there's been cases where we've cut our investment in half to bring in another great investor who we think can be really helpful to the business. So I think we, together with the companies, are very choosy about the kinds of partners that you work with. Because it is, they joke it's like a marriage, but it really is. You spend a lot of time with your investors through the good times and the bad times. Um, so you want to make sure you're working with the right kind of people. Perhaps you can add as an entrepreneur some of your battle stories with your investors. Or uh, maybe I can just add another um, source of finance. Um, at least here in Berlin, there's a government-backed uh, program. It's called Profit. It's a um, kind of loan debt kind of uh, thing that's backed by the EU and by uh, the city of Berlin. And it also has some subsidies, so you have to pay some money back. You get some money and you can just keep it. There's no equity being sold. Um, the interest is very low. The process of getting that money, at least for tech product savvy teams, is, uh, is very clear. It's uh, even quicker than getting uh, venture capital. So if you're not planning on raising like two digit million rounds, then um, we've done profit and it's, uh, it's been nice, it's been good. And um, I'd like to see more people taking advantage of that uh, government backed uh, program. But did you have to um, accept personal liability then? Because I think that's that's the case now. Yeah, I mean, but that's, that's I mean, uh, quite that's a risk game, too. you know. I <laughs> okay, mean, yeah, well. if you're the founder, <laughs> if you don't or, believe in that, yeah. If you really believe yeah. in the thing yeah, okay. you do, then you have to accept yeah. some at least. Yeah, but that's liability. something that I, I know that um, a lot of startup companies um, are thinking about getting profit, mm -hmm. and then in the end they think, well, this personal liability for all the money that you're getting, um, because failing is also okay, uh, in, in my sure. uh, view. Yeah, so. Um, if, you, if, if failing automatically means that you're bankrupt, um, then this is a difficult deal to take. Too. Maybe for your stage, there's one more um, source. Um, we've gone through all kinds of uh, finance sources. We also had a um, scholarship for founders that was 130K uh, right before we took uh, business angel money. And then we went to another scholarship that was another 40K. So the first. 150, 160,000 euros that went into SoFi Tutor were just um, given to us for free. We never had to pay it back. Uh, there was no equity involved. It was just uh, plain government-backed subsidies for founders uh, with products uh, and tech um, ideas. So um, that would be also something. It's called Exist Gründerstipendium mm. for some who don't know it. And also the Boyd Hochschule um, has a, a scholarship that's uh, worth checking out. That's just two more ideas. So that might bring you to the stage where you're sure enough to take some uh, personal liability. 
you are sure that your idea is going to fly. And there's a great another source of, uh, of capital as well, which is uh, revenue from customers. Um, <laughs> people tend to forget about that one. But actually, yeah. sell stuff for more than it costs you. Don't spend a lot of money to get customers in and use that to finance the business. And there's been some great companies that have been built without any sort of financing coming in. And guess what? That's the best for the founders because they own 100% of the company at that point. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that works as well. Yeah. Which brings you to another source of capital, strategic investors. Uh, when do you think is the right time for strategic investors? Is there a right time for strategic investors? So I, I would be very careful with strategic investors because you might want to sell to strategic investors and you don't want them on board because they to know too much about the business. Um, so I think if you can prevent it, uh, there is rarely a situation where you want strategic investors on board. Sometimes you're working on a very specific product and there's only strategic investors that were willing to invest into your product. Um, but that, it's just a tricky situation. So I would avoid it if I can, um, because you want to keep these guys on the sidelines, get them excited, and at some point there will be the time uh, you want them to you know, talk to them. Do you mean, um, sorry, um, do you mean strategic venture capital or strategic incubators? Like there's uh, uh, the Scout Group who has an incubator, um, and then there's Telecom who has an incubator. Right, yeah, I, I would, I would say potential incubator. customers, you, uh, potential businesses where you want to sell your business to. Yeah. I don't think VCs can be defined as strategic because um, all they all claim that they have all this value add that they provide you, which might be all these positioned lie. as strategic, and as all VCs lie. <laughs> <coughs> So uh, it's primarily companies, no? and, and those, I would, if possible, I would avoid um, because it just limits your options um, and it might even prevent you from selling your business because depending on the share class that they have, it makes it very hard to sell a business to somebody else and that deteriorates the value of your business. Perhaps uh, one of the last questions that we have is um, there are certainly certain fashions in investing. Um, we can talk about them. Like Perhaps education is a For fashion, example, yeah. education is certainly, you know, we know that uh, Bill and Melinda Gates invest quite heavily in that, and uh, it's been quite, b quite a bit in the press. E-commerce in Berlin is another fashion. Perhaps, uh, what do you think is hot now? But it's, uh, so for me, it was, so I've been an investor only for eight weeks, so I'm pretty new to the game, and it's quite exciting, because if you're an entrepreneur, you always work on one idea, and you keep working for multiple years on this one idea. And I feel like the last eight weeks, I've been like in a candy shop. Now, I look at all these great companies around the world, and they're working on so many amazing ideas. So it's really hard for me to pick something that's hot, because uh, it's very uh, interesting how many different uh, teams work on, on, on exciting ideas. Uh, so in the end, you end up thinking something is hot that you understand, that you relate to a little bit. So I could only tell you what's hot from my perspective. And uh, a couple of things I've noticed. One thing is, in terms of e-commerce, you see all these curated shopping um, concepts. So I guess these plain e-commerce players, this game is done. I mean, there's Amazon, there, there's Zalando here in, in Germany, and in every country you have one of those. But now you see this other layer of curated shopping on top, and it's exciting to see um, if, you have a if you have a need, you go somewhere and you get your demand fulfilled. So that's going to be Amazon, or like Google is a demand fulfillment. But what if you just want to browse for stuff? Uh, and right now you go on high street and then you buy stuff and then there's many companies that think they'll take over that business this browsing and just buying stuff because you feel like it which might be i don't know 50 60 percent of all fashion retail so um so i think that's interesting i don't understand it well but i think it's very interesting and hot then learning is very exciting because i think it's a huge market and it's terrible the way it works today uh, so and um, and i like uh, personally a lot finance because finance is, is, is a huge industry it's completely dysfunctional uh, as there's a lot of capital looking for yield but interest rates are close to zero and then the banks they're getting central bank money for free and they don't give it to anybody to deleverage themselves so there's no money coming into the system and we see more and more companies around the world that are actually just connecting money looking for yield with people that need the money because the banks not, don't do it anymore so i think uh, that's another a third ex uh, topic that i think is very hot right now Tama, what do you think what do you see uh, the crowdsourcing crowd well um first I think my experience is that uh, in most cases when people say, I know what's hot, in the end they're, they're wrong. <laughs> or uh, they're not going to tell you if they really know. Um, but of course, I mean, I don't doubt what you're saying. That was certainly <laughs> correct. But um, um, yeah, well, it, it's very difficult to say there's very many areas. Um, and, and, and you have to understand the business to say if it's really hot or not. Um, I find um, second screen um, companies very interesting. Uh, certainly a topic that will um, evolve a lot more, especially here in Europe. I think the US is um, um, far ahead in this sector um, compared to, uh, on the consumer side, compared to, to Europe. And uh, well, for, for crowd investing, um, 
companies where the business model is easy to understand is always hot. Yeah, it's, it's always easy um, to fund companies where people say, okay, this I understand it. I don't have to be a professional investor to know how this uh, works. And then people will invest in it. And then, of course, companies where people start dreaming. We heard uh, Tame earlier today that was one startup that was financed um, by Companisto, um, a search engine for Twitter. Um, that's certainly something where people say, wow, Twitter and then a search engine and Google for Twitter. And it sounds great. And there's something where um, that's hot for crowd investing, at least. We talked to e-learning is hot. It's a big market, obviously. Um, how do you look to differentiate yourself, and what do you think is the areas that are interesting in e-learning? Mm. Well, um, obviously, there's uh, there's not been a lot of digitization in the whole school sector. There's still printed textbooks, kilos of them that kids have to carry on their backs every day. So um, everyone in the whole world is waiting for that moment when everyone's having kind of like iPads, ebooks, stuff like this. And that's going to disrupt the whole industry because the old textbook publishers won't be ready, I believe. Um, for now, um, since this is not the point, this is not the right time yet, uh, we focus on the after school market. If you're talking about like kindergarten to 12th grade, this kind of market. So it's uh, about tutoring, it's about um, B2C relationships, uh, selling the product to parents and to children, not to school principals, not to uh, school districts or school boards. So this is the whole um, school space. Um, we see lots of stuff happening in universities. Um, there's um, cool stuff happening, massive open online courses, MOOCs, probably some people know it. Uh, that's something that's being funded a lot in the US. Um, still searching for um, business models that will hopefully evolve around these companies. Uh, and then there's the whole market around professional learning. So any kind of organization who needs to train its staff in compliance, uh, sales, whatever, that's, that's a market that's becoming more and more digital. And that's kind of like the second wave already. There's been some digital approaches in the dot-com bubble uh, time where it's probably been, it would have been cheaper to take all these people who've participated in digital learning and just put them in aeroplanes and fly them to some remote island and teach them there than developing all that crazy stuff. Um, but now people have a clearer eye on what they want to do and uh, I believe that's, that's going to take off. Um, at this point, I think we would like to open questions to the audience. Um, are there any questions? Presumably, there are lots of young entrepreneurs here looking to hear about uh, <laughs> the money. <laughs> I mean, otherwise, I would like to know what you think, Sean, what, what's hot. Ah, sectors. <laughs> uh, that's a good question. So, uh, we think about it in, in two ways. While, while you guys come up with questions, I'll answer this quickly. We haven't forgotten about that, so we need some good questions. But uh, number one, we, um, we come up with themes about how we think the web is going to be affecting uh, businesses and individuals and things like disintermediation of middlemen, um, or we call it um, kind of little data, but taking all this massive amount of data that's out there and making relevant and meaningful to me as an individual. Um, but we try not to pick individual companies. Instead, we pick themes, and then we try to match companies against those themes. Uh, but then on top of that, we also put together a monthly report, which looks at where are we getting a lot of business plans? What are people coming to us with? Because the fact is, entrepreneurs are the ones at the front end um, really leading the charge. And um, we, we see it. They joke it's like London buses. You don't see anything, and all of a sudden, five in a row come at once. And we, we get all the time people come to us going, that's the greatest idea. I'm the only one that's ever thought of this. And then all of a sudden, you receive three of those kind of in three days of the same kind of thing. So, um, and in the end, it all comes down to execution anyway. Um, personally, I'm a big believer in um, mobile health and uh, the ability to do consumer health led by these kind of devices that we carry with us. And I think it's only going to be a matter of years before, if you've ever seen Star Trek, we, have, we all carry tricorders with us where we kind of scan each other or you scan yourself and you can see how, how fit you are or any uh, illnesses or anything like that. It's going to be amazing. I think another question that I, I often actually get uh, from people approaching me is saying, I've tried to pitch my business to 10 VCs. I think it's very interesting, but what do I do wrong? Can you, you know, both of you comment on what is it you're looking for when an uh, entrepreneur approaches you? So um, I always try to understand what the business is about. I like simple business ideas because for me it's hard to imagine how to monetize something once traction is there, how to get to traction, how to get stickiness. I mean, there's a lot of companies that build great product ideas. 
but you don't know what will make these things stick. And that's for me very hard. So I just tell for myself, what I really like is to understand um, what is, how does the business work? Why is it profitable? How does the team think about it? And is it worthwhile to invest? Meaning, can this money be used for good? to buy customers that are profitable, to expand into buying, bring business on board. So uh, can they do something with my money? And these are the two questions I need to answer. If you pitch to 10 people and that none of them are interested, um, then maybe you should change your pitch, no? I mean, you don't take the same deck and go out to 50 people. I always say, um, find the top four or five investors you love, put them aside, take five others, pitch to them, iterate and then go to the five that you wanted to go initially and, and, and then it should work somehow, you should get some traction. If you don't get any traction, then something's wrong. Yeah, from my side, I, I think too often we try to overcomplicate the investing process, especially at the stage where we, where we invest, where we're putting in one to two million euros into companies. So we try to keep it simple. We look at the quality of the team that's there because the fact is companies, they're not gonna pivot, I hate the word pivot, but you're gonna hit rough patches and how you sail through those rough patches is important. And that comes down to the quality of the team. And the second is the overall size of the market. If it's a really big market with a really good team, they'll figure out something and they'll make something work along, along those, that path. From your side as an entrepreneur, how many mistakes have you made? How many paths you traveled that uh, led you nowhere and you had to change? How do you approach that? Many mistakes, definitely, um, and still doing some. Uh, maybe just um, like Fabian said, it's always nice to talk to people that you really didn't, you don't, you don't really want them as an investor, but what it is, it's like free consulting. People are being paid uh, to look at your idea and give you some feedback. So um, chances are when you do it for the first time, your, your slides, the idea of your business that you have, it's probably not going to have enough meat yet to, to really convince someone. But taking your time, talking to people, people who really take their time, not just some guy on some networking event who's saying, yeah, cool idea, great stuff, keep on doing that, but someone who really sits down with you, goes through your slides, and then take your time afterwards. Um, like the first uh, round we raised, um, in the beginning we had like 15 slides maybe. So we pitched the first investors and uh, added slides all the time. So when we convinced our, our final investors, we had like 100 slides. Of course, it was still 15 slides, but the rest was backup slides, so 85 backup slides. So every question that would pop up in these really good meetings in the, in the later stage of pitching um, the, the investors that we really wanted, uh, we always had some backup slides. We always could talk about stuff, and it, it taught so us a lot. I was, was going to jump in on that, because you talk about kind of, you, you know, you actually want to go in with 10 slides and then have about 90 as backup, and then you can pull to it. But, uh, and I'm going to plug, I'm going to name drop a company. We have this company in Berlin called Scarosso, the shoes. I don't know if you guys know, they make kind of high-end Italian shoes. We've called it in our office the Scarasso now, which is, they were amazing. They would come in, we didn't invest. I think someone here did invest um, in the company. It's a great company. I love, I think, no, I'm not wearing their shoes today. But they were great because they would come out of a meeting and the next morning they would email saying, here's the three questions that you had in that meeting and here's five slides to back it up. And basically instill such confidence in an investor when you, not only, not only you paid attention in the meeting to the, what their concerns were, but you answer in an analytical manner the next day with real data, and it's been amazing. We use it now ourselves, um, you know, with our investors. Another question that came up, uh, perhaps over what touched on today, was how, as a founder, do you keep a fair amount of capital to yourself rather than try to go through various rounds and then end up with 10% of capital? From both sides, how would you, what would you advise young entrepreneurs? But it depends really on the business. Certain businesses that you can scale by money efficiently, maybe it makes sense to dilute because the business will be bigger in the end. Uh, but certain businesses where um, it's not going to be such a big market in the end, uh, where the outcome will not be a $2 billion company, you should be very, very prudent if you raise money and should rather go slower. Uh, so I think um, you as an entrepreneur, you always have to just think about, can I make the pie much so much bigger than I dilute on every round? And then I think um, the answers were there, no? I think it, um, when you do it for the first time, you probably won't know how much money you will need until um, you're going to reach profitability. And then once you reach profitability, uh, it's really up to you, or I mean, even, even earlier probably, uh, how, mu how much faster you want to grow. Um, and uh, to me, it's always uh, that balance of uh, how much do I want to keep of the company and how much faster do I want to grow the company. Because that's what drives me, growing the company, um, having this great team, this great product evolving, not just like sitting there being profitable and uh, okay, and then, so what, what do we do now? Yeah. 
But I think it's uh, important to, to accept as a, as a founder to what Fabian was saying that um, being diluted is not necessarily a bad thing. If the investment that's coming in um, is, is, is worth it and it's making the pie bigger, then it's a good thing for you to do that financing round. If you get that context, that networks and, and so on that kicks um, your big uh, business, then um, of course, uh, it's not a, a bad thing to, to, um, to give shares to an investor. Yeah. You, you know where I see companies where, where founders really get hurt? It's not in actually the, the round of capital and the dilution that comes from that. You know, raise as much money as you can at each round. Where they get really hurt is after they raise money, they spend it too quickly or money gets wasted, and you have to go back hat in hand without having proven any major milestones. And that's when you really get killed, because then it's a down round, a flat round. As long as the company's really growing nicely, the dilution you can deal with is completely fine. So it's really about when you do raise money, raise as much as you can, don't worry about the dilution, bigger pie, all that kind of stuff, and I agree with it. But after you raise the money, spend it incredibly carefully. Think about the equity that you've given away for that money. And you know, someone talks about you don't want the big offices earlier on, you don't. Keep everything as lean and as tight as you can, as long as you can. Perhaps to, uh, I don't know if there are any questions from the audience to wrap up if you could uh, give uh, one word of advice to the people sitting at here talk to people don't keep your ideas for yourself talk to people yeah don't give up be persistent and then um, yeah don't give up yeah you, uh, yeah I'm gonna Okay. Say the same thing as that. Just, just talk to people. I mean, you can learn so much more than the risk. No one's going to steal your idea. Like, they got their own ideas. Just talk to people, get advice, get thoughts. Now, all the smart guys, um, they have already ideas, and they're working very busy on them. So the chance that you hit somebody with your idea that's just idling around and it's going to run with your idea, it's very unlikely. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.